My dearest brothers and sisters, we all pride ourselves and hope when we, when we obtain something that we own things that are resilient, that are strong, that are robust. When we go out into the world to make a big purchase, we don't want to buy things that are cheap and flimsy that if you drop it, it'll break, right? If something, if the wind blows, it'll collapse. But we, we value things, again, that will stand up to the test of time. So we purchase a vehicle, all of us here, if we go and we came to Jummah on, in a car, right? We say we're going to buy a car and we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He always protects us. And we wish we never get into a car accident. We wish we never hit anybody or nobody hits us. But we know it's possible. So we say we're going to buy a car that has some safety features. It has some airbags. It's got some shocks. So if it goes over a bump, it's not going to break. And you wouldn't buy a car if I said, you know, I'll sell you a car that can go from 0 to 60 in 2 seconds. It's super fast. But if it hits like a pebble on the road, it's broken. See, I don't want a car that's like that. It's too flimsy. Or when we purchase a home. We live in a home. We want to live in homes that are stable to stand up from extreme wind or if there's a fire or if you come from the West Coast, earthquakes. So we buy homes that have these features built into them. So we know, we ask Allah, oh Allah, protect our homes from disaster, but we make sure we buy homes that are some level of disaster proofing. And this leads to a general life principle that the human being typically operates under, which is we plan our life wishing for the best. We hope for the best, but we also plan for things being less than ideal. In other words, we wish for the best, but we plan for the worst, which is why we have rainy day savings accounts. This is why we have all kinds of mechanisms in our life that will protect ourselves from something that goes wrong. And that's the wise way to live one's life. And that's part of tawakkul. Is tr trusting Allah doesn't mean that you say, you know what, Allah, everything will always be perfect, so I only anticipate perfection. So that even when things don't go in an optimal way, I'm ready for those things, and my home will not collapse, my car will not collapse, whatever it is I possess will not fall apart. Yet subhanAllah, I'm here today to speak about how we raise our children. And I find, as someone who has been studying this for almost a decade now, that people in today's world do not think about their children the way they think about their worldly possessions. We wish for the best and we plan for the worst when it comes to the things in life. Like I said, our homes and our cars and our retirement, so on and so forth. But when we think about our children, many parents, they wish for the best and they only plan for the best. And this comes from a very good place. It's a good niyyah that we all want our kids to have these wonderful lives where they're safe from any of the pains that we might have gone through or the disasters that we might have experienced or the hardships that we look back and say, you know, those were so difficult on us. We want to shield ourselves, our kids from those. Yet underlying it actually is a false assumption about the reality of this world. And it actually goes against the aqidah of a Muslim, which is that me and you as parents, as mothers and fathers, do not possess the ability to shield our children from the inevitable stressors, challenges, and difficulties that will hit our children. We don't have that. We are not God, to put it bluntly. We don't have the, pos the ability to prevent them from getting sick. We don't have the ability to prevent them from having challenging marriages or having children that they have difficulty raising. And rather, to accept that this is the sunnah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this universe, and it comes with a hikmah, it comes with a wisdom. And we have all heard many times that this life is a test. That is a, you know, it's almost cliche to say that at this point. But I think what's different is to say that the things that hit us in life are not simply tests that we're trying to pass through, but they're actually been placed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to allow us to grow and to mature. And so Allah says in the Quran, just to reiterate this point, Alif Lamim Hasiban Nasu Ayutraku Ayakulu Amanna Hum La Yuftanu. That do people believe? They're just gonna say, I believe, will be left to say that I believe, and you will not be tested. Does anyone have that assumption? We should not. Allah has tested those who came before, so He knows who's true, truthful, and He knows who's not. Allah says, Surely we will test them with something of fear, of hunger, of, of all different challenges in life. And so the believer, the believing father and mother, have to have this belief in their heart that, Oh Allah, I want the best for my kid, 
But you will, with your wisdom, O Allah, introduce hardships into their life, stressors into their life, challenges into their life, and you know why they need to deal with these stressors. You do it out of your love, you do it out of your mercy, you do it out of your ultimate wisdom. And we see this, subhanAllah, in the natural world around us. And so the premise that I want to give is that we change the way we look at difficulties in our children's lives. They're not things to be averted. There are things that we just learn with. They are going to happen. How do we deal with them? And so if you look at the natural world, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us, وَفِي الْأَرْضِ آيَاتُ لِلْمُقِينَ وَفِي أَنفُسِكُمْ أَفَلَا تُبُصِرُونَ You will see the sunnah of stressors being essential for growth in the natural world. I come from California. We have the largest trees in the world there. And these trees that can grow to over 300 feet tall and whose trunks are about you know, 30, 40 feet you know, going around in diameter or more than that, you'd say, where do they come from? They come from tiny seeds that have to be exposed to fire. If there's no fire, you don't have gigantic sequoia trees or redwood trees. And what parent wants to expose their kids to a fire? They say, well, fires are dangerous. But without a fire, you cannot have this strong, robust, majestic tree. So the stress is needed. And you think about your own body. I'm looking in the audience now and I see some brothers, mashallah, you can tell that they are well built. They've put the time into taking care of their physical health. And you know that if you want to be physically strong, you actually have to stress your body out. You have to go to the gym, you have to play a sport, you have to run, and you put that stress, tension, onto your body with the weights or with any resistance, and your body, your muscles actually tear. These little micro tears when you're lifting a weight or you're running or you're playing something hard causes your body to say, you know what, this tension, now my muscles have to expand and repair themselves. So now they become stronger and able to deal with the expected resistance that they're going to face. We call this you know, hypertrophy if you want. So no one would be here and say, you know what, I want to be healthy. I want my kids to be healthy, but I worry they could get hurt. So let's please just sit on the beautiful couch all the time. Because if you sit on the couch, you won't sprain your ankle. You may not break an arm or a leg. But you can't get hurt sitting on a couch. It's true, you're not going to get hurt sitting on the couch. But your muscles will actually get weaker day by day, week by week. They'll atrophy. And you'll say, man, I was sitting comfortably on this couch. Why am I so weak now? Because you did not expose your body to the stress and the tension that it needs to actually get stronger and stronger and stronger. So we see that in the natural world. And now I want us to bring us to the way we think about our children. And I love this analogy that was given by an author. He spoke about our being, living life and thinking about a flame. If anyone has been camping, if anyone has ever made a barbecue, you know you light a fire, right? You have a match and you have a tiny little flame. Now that flame, two things can happen to it. You need that flame to get bigger. So you can either cook or so you can warm yourself if you're camping. And the opposite is if that flame goes out, right? You can't use it. Now think about your children like this tiny little flame. And they have the potential to grow into these strong, resilient, capable human beings. But only if we expose them to what's necessary for fire to grow, which is what? Wind. So if you have a flame, if you expose it to the right amount of wind, it grows into a giant flame. And if you have wind that's too strong, and it could wipe out that flame as well. So the exact same element can either make it strong or can knock it out. But if you were to say, you know what, my kid, I don't want to expose him to the wind ever. You've guaranteed that he cannot grow. Whereas if you expose him to the wind, the chance of growth is actually possible. So in the khutbah today, we have two principles, my dear brothers and sisters, that we want to think about when it comes to raising resilient children. And these two principles come to two different aspects and facets of life. Principle number one is we want our children to be psychologically comfortable with unpredictability in this life. Psychologically comfortable with unpredictability in this life. And this gets at kind of the opposite of what the modern world is all about. The modern world is all about removing unpredictability from your life. We use a GPS, a GPS whenever we travel anywhere, so we know exactly if I leave the house at this time, what time do I arrive at work or at school or at the masjid, right? We have thermostats in our home that tell us every day I know what temperature my house is going to be. Right? The whole technology industry is about making your life more predictable than it was yesterday. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He's the only one who has certain knowledge of this universe. And uncertainty is a fact of this life. And the sooner that we accept it, 
and that we learn to trust Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the easier it is for us to function in an unpredictable world that has global warming, that has wars, that has natural disasters, that has financial crises. These things pop up from decade to decade and you cannot predict it. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in Surah Luqman, in one of the beautiful ayat, about the nature that you, O human being, stop expecting that you will know what's going to happen. Stop demanding predictability and certainty in life. Life is full of ambiguity. Life is full of gray issues. Life is full of surprises. So Allah says, إِنَّ اللَّهَ عِنْدَهُ عِلْمُ السَّاعَةِ وَيُنَزِّلُ الْغَيْثَ وَيَعْلَمُ مَا فِي الْأَرْحَامِ وَمَا تَدْرِي نَفْسٌ مَاذَا تَكْسِبُ غَدَى وَمَا تَدْرِي نَفْسٌ بِأَيِّ أَرْضٍ تَمُوتِ إِنَّ اللَّهَ عَلِيمٌ خبير. Allah tells the human being in this one verse, pretty much all the things you wish you knew, that you will not know them. He says, indeed Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone knows when the day of judgment is going to be. He alone knows when the rain is going to fall. And by the way, knowing the weather is a huge part of human existence. We all check our phones, check the weather so we know what to wear, right? If we're going to travel, right? Our economies depend on it. So much depends on knowing the weather. But it's all probabilistic. You might know, you might, the forecast could be right, it could be wrong. We all wish we knew what's when we are, a mother is pregnant with a child, you want to know, is it a boy? Is it a girl? Will they be rich? Will they be, will they be believers? When we just wonder and wonder and wonder about their personality. And if we, we, if we could know that, we would just be so happy to remove that unpredictable because our whole life is spent in making our kids better and investing in their well-being. And so we want to remove the chance of failure. But Allah knows alone whether our kids are going to be happy or sad, successful or not, believers or not. And then he knows our income. This is something which all of us hear. We love the stability of our income. We love Friday at 5 p.m. My boss deposits my company money in my account. I can predict my rent. I can know how much to spend on groceries, how much for this, how much for that, how much for retirement. That predictability is good for us or we like it. But Allah reminds us time and again through things like COVID and other things that you know what? There's unpredictability even in your income. Your income might go up today. It might go down today. As predictable as your job may seem to be, there'll be things in life that Allah throws at you to kind of remove some of that. And then Allah alone knows when you're going to die. Right? So all of these things that Allah is telling us is all in the service of what? Saying, oh human being, relinquish the desire for control and certainty in every aspect of your life. And as part of what we want to do in this life is to tame everything. How much can we tame the universe to just be exactly how I want it to be? the weather the way I want it to be, my kids to behave the way I want them to behave, the way my spouse I want them to be, where they're going to go, what they're going to do, everything, the more control and the more certainty I have over my life, the more comfortable I feel. But the, the flip side of this is that because we cannot control it, when things don't go the way we want them to go, it sets us up for disaster. It sets us up for stress, for anxiety, for all kinds of other kind of psychological difficulties. And now, before I just say this is limited to raising resilient children, just to think about the dunya in these terms. Yes, we teach our kids that only Allah knows, right, and that, you know, what is going to happen to the world, right, and, and all these natural phenomena and our income when we live and when we die, but also in religious affairs. Sometimes we do a disservice when we teach our children that Islam and everything in our faith is absolutely certain. Everything is 100% known. Islam is the truth. Allah is the truth and Muhammad Sallallahu is the truth. But our ability to discern that truth is absolutely, absolutely probabilistic and it's actually rather unpredictable. And what Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala tells an ayah in the Quran to kind of give us some of this. Because one of the things we're seeing in today's world is young people who come and they read a hadith or they read an ayah or they see an, an opinion about Islam that doesn't fit into their box. They say, I don't understand this ayah. I don't understand this hadith. Maybe Islam is not the truth. And you'd say, why? Why are you doubting your faith? Because there's one element that you don't fully understand. And it comes back to everything should be black and white. Everything should be clear. Everything should be certain. And when I don't have certainty in some religious affair, I don't know if I should believe in any of this faith. Allah says in Surah Ali Imran, Long verse where Allah is saying, in this Qur'an there are ayat that are clear cut and easy to understand and those are there's some uncertainty in them. Meaning there's multiple interpretations. And people who have a disease in their heart, they want everything to be black and white. And Allah says this causes problems. 
This is the deviation. But those who are firm in knowledge, they say, all of this is from Allah. Because only Allah knows the interpretation of these things. So in the ayat and in the hadith that have some level of unpredictability or uncertainty to us, not to Allah, it's certain that we have intellectual humility. You know, we do that in the dunya. If I study calculus and I don't understand something, I don't say math is wrong. I don't believe in mathematics. Or if I read in biology a theory and I don't understand it, biology must be all false. Because maybe I'm limited in my knowledge. When it comes to Islam, approach it with that same intellectual humility. So that's principle number one. Quickly in the second khutbah, we'll talk about principle number two. Number two, number two. Alhamdulillahi wa kafa wa salatan wa salaman ala rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa nwala huwa alladhi arsala rasulahu bil huda wa deen al haqqi li yudhiruhu ala deen kulli wa kafa billahi shahida. Principle number two, my dear brothers and sisters, is so principle number one is getting us psychologically comfortable with unpredictability in the dunya or in the deen. Whether it be in the religious affairs or the worldly affairs, accepting that you will not know everything and Humility with that and tawakkul with Allah with that. Number two with raising resilient children is raise them to be physically comfortable with discomfort. To be physically comfortable with discomfort. And this again is because this life as the Prophet Muhammad taught us will not always be as perfect as we want it to be. So if we buy our children all the time the best of everything, you eat the best of food, you wear the best of clothes, everything in our life is so comfortable and nice, what happens when Challenges hit. The Prophet said, والسلام, when he heard the companions speaking about the dunya, he said, He said, simplicity is from faith. Having simple, humble things is part of faith. And he said, I warn you from always seeking luxury, for the true servants of Allah do not perpetually seek luxury. And then he explained the logic behind this in another narration attributed to the Prophet and with Umar, where he said, He said, rough it. Rough it, for indeed good times do not always last. You do not know if your daughter will marry someone who's rich or poor. You do not know if your son one day will have high income or low income. And if you acclimate them to the finer things of life today, what happens when they don't get the best tomorrow? That is when you see people who fall apart. They fall apart in their deen, or they even fall apart in their dunya. And so the Prophet is telling us, get your kids used to this. Sometimes give them food that's humble. Sometimes Take them out in the wilderness. Let them sleep in the cold once in a while. Let them sleep out in the heat. Let them be in situations where they feel rough a little bit and uncomfortable. Put them in sports. Put them in situations where it puts, pushes them to their limit. Let them get punched or kicked or choked in healthy settings. All this under the name of making our children resilient because we do this in a controlled setting today. So when they're out of the cocoon and the world hits them with whatever, they say, you know what, I know how to deal with this. Because my parents taught me. I was raised to not always have luxury. So if I don't have that luxurious food today, I'm fine with it. If anything is uncomfortable, I'm fine with it. And this is why the Prophet said, we'll close with a hadith. He said that the example of a believer is like that of a tender plant. That when the wind blows, right, it might blow left and right. But at the end, it's flexible enough to stand up after right, the stressors have hit it. And that's the example of a believer. And the example of a disbeliever is like that strong, solid-looking pine tree. It looks so firm, but because of its rigidity, that when the time comes, Allah strikes it down, right, and it collapses. Make your children have that spiritual, intellectual, physical flexibility. Whether they're hit with a physical, intellectual, spiritual hardship, that they know how to rebound from it, and they have the hikmah to know that this was being done to strengthen them. And that's what Allah did with all of His Anbiya. He took them through these stressors, Musa alayhi salam, out of the palace, into being a shepherd, into hardship. Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, from being, you know, from the elite, right, of Banu Hashim, and he's being an orphan and being put through all these hardships. Why? You cannot lead the world. You cannot lead your community. You cannot lead your family if you do not know how to deal with the elements of life. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to mix up amongst those who have resilient children. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to mix up amongst those who have kids and who we ourselves are capable of standing up to all the difficulties of life.